Good morning, everyone. Oh, good afternoon, I should say. And welcome to our 15th annual lecture on aging, now known as the Michael A. Creeden Memorial Lecture on Aging. And I am very happy to see uh, friends and students in the room here for today's lecture. We are uh, lucky and uh, happy to have uh, Dr. Renee Flores, who is an internist, a geriatrician, and an expert in sexual medicine with us. She is the director of the Sexual Health Clinic for Older Adults at the Center for Healthy Aging at the University of Texas Medical Center in Houston. And without wanting to go on too long, I can say that I know that her life course brought her to the topic of sexual medicine and that she has a great deal of passion for this particular topic. So we are uh, happy and grateful that she was able to come and uh, share some of her time and knowledge with us today. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to her so that we begin. If you have questions, please hold them till the end. We will uh, have time at the end to take those. And Dr. Flores. All right. Uh, welcome. Are you all able to hear me with this mic? OK. So I do have a couple of interactive questions. Um, you'll do them straight from your cell phone for, for poll everywhere. Um, and you'll, when the um, screen comes up, it'll tell you what you need to text. Um, and so hopefully this will be not just me talking, but um, a little bit more interactive as well. So today I'm talking about sexual medicine. It's patient-centered care for older adults. And we're using a multidisciplinary approach um, to uh, approach this topic. So my objective today is that we're going to define sexual health. Uh, we're going to have a basic understanding of elder sexuality and physiology, and this how does this relate to our understanding of sexuality in older adults? Identify sexual norms that limit open discussions uh, with regards to sexuality in older adults, and then apply this multidisciplinary approach to improve sexual health. So first, we're going to define sexual health. So I actually want to hear from you guys. What do you think sexual health is? So if you can text um, to uh, R. Flores to 22333. And then it'll give you a little box that says you can enter your answer. It going through. Okay. Is anybody else submitting and it not going through? There we go. Good. Managing sexual transmitted diseases. Good, a daily activity, daily living. Good. So I think, you know, it, it's such a broad, broad topic, sexual health and what sexual health actually means. And all of you are kind of targeting a little bit of, of what sexual health is. So when we look at uh, sexuality as an integral part of human life, we talked about activities of daily living, it carries the awesome potential to create new life. It can foster intimacy and bonding as well as shared a pleasure in our relationships. And sexual health is intricately uh, bound to both physical and mental health. 
But what does the World Health Organization say if we're actually defining sexual health? And say they look at the physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. And I think there's a few people that mentioned that. Um, it's not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. So we think about sexually transmitted diseases. We think about activities of daily living. Um, but it's, if it's not merely the absence, one thing that we have trouble talking about when it comes to sexual health is the actual pleasure of sex. And so sexual health requires this positive, respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relations. And it's that pleasure and safe sexual experience free of coercion discrimination and violence. And I really like this picture of an onion because we're gonna talk about a lot of different layers of sexual health when we go through this presentation. So sexual health can be an ethical perspective. Uh, it can be social and cultural, biologic, physiologic, or emotional and psychologic. And we'll kind of break this down um, throughout the presentation. But when we look at sexual health, it's multi-dimensional. Um, and so when we talk about sexuality, it's a way in which somebody expresses themselves as a sexual being. So it can include biological health or biological sex, how you do sexual expression, sexual identity, gender roles, communication within sexuality, relationship roles, uh, looking at body image, especially when it comes to the older population, sexual orientation and then sexual desire or the lack thereof of sexual desire. So how many are y'all from? How many of y'all are familiar with the gingerbread person? So the gingerbread person is just the different layers of sexuality. So one could be gender identity. So gender identity is how we identify ourselves. More of a brain component. How do you think about yourself in your head? And this chemistry or the hormone levels is how you interpret what this means. And so when we look at gender expression, we look at how how you express yourself. Do you? dress more feminine or do you have more masculine? And all of these are really very fluid. You can sometimes, if you're going out to play sports, you're probably not gonna be wearing a dress. You're gonna be wearing um, shorts, which can be used unisexually. And so this expression can actually be very fluid. Biological sex, this refers to whether or not you're born with ovaries or testes or born with both in circumstances of intersex. And then sexual orientation, which is how um, you physically, spiritually, who are you attracted to? And that's kind of what your heart says. Who do you um, feel sexually attracted to? And this can be on a homosexual scale versus heterosexual scale or somewhere in between. And again, this can fluctuate and is very fluid. So when we talk about sexual health, why is it so important? And so it's not just important for older adults, although that's where our main topic is today, but it helps relieve tension in people of all ages. It helps relax physically and emotionally. It causes a distraction from multiple symptoms. It's potential relief of pain because of endorphins. Restoration of normalcy. So if someone's getting older and they have a lot of medical problems, sex gives them that sense of normalcy. Helping people express and work through difficult feelings. Empowers people to take control in an out of control situation. And then it helps people connect with who they are and they're not looked at as a patient with illness. And so yesterday I was kind of giving an example of, I had this patient who um, I was actually seeing on the more of the palliative side, but she was 40 years old and she was dying of metastatic breast cancer. And she actually had come into the hospital because she had uncontrolled pain. And her request was, yes, of course, control her pain, but her number one priority is that she wanted to have sex with her husband before she died. And so this, importance of this connection with somebody helps us see beyond the illness and helps us see them more as a person, of course, incorporating all this for the restoration of, of feeling normal. So look, skipping to or changing to our next um, objective, we look at how do we have all of these things and incorporate them into this basic knowledge of physiology um, and understanding how does this relate to older adults. So when we talk about the female physiologic changes and physical changes, there are a lot of studies that look at when somebody, when a woman stops having her period and she goes through menopause, that this can be a very life-defining event. And women can view menstruation as a, as a symbol of reproduction, a symbol of youth, um, and it's a symbol of bonding. So when women actually stop menstruation, this women can tend to feel less of a woman because now they can't have children. And that's 
a lot of what society has, has bonded with being a woman in, in menstruation and she's no longer capable of producing. And plus with, with menstruation, you get these changes in vaginal membranes, the, the, the membranes of the vaginal mucosa become very thin, there's less moisture and less lubrication. So when we talk about female sexual medicine, which, you know, we talked about pleasure, but there's also sexual pain that comes with intercourse, especially with the changes of the hormones, um, sexual pain from vaginismus, decreased libido. So if, if uh, females are having a change in these hormones, they don't have the drive to have sex like they used to. Sexual arousal may be um, compromised, hypoactive arousal sexual disorder, um, sexual concerns for women after cancer. Um, and this may be body image, whether or not they have removed their ovaries, removed the uterus, which again is a symbol of sexuality for women or even removal of the breast. If women um, find it very arousing to have breast stimulation and now they're going through breast cancer or had a mastectomy, how does that impact their view of sexual medicine or their view of sexuality? And of course, STIs um, and being exposed to SPI, STIs is a component of female sexual medicine. What about males? So males, the physical signs are less dramatic because they don't have this, this um, drop of hormones like with menopause. So there's no sudden decline in the hormones and changes can be quite gradual, but sometimes can be just as impactful as far as being able to have, uh, need longer time for erections, needing more um, interactions or inter intercourse or have more intercourse without ejaculation less intense ejaculation or longer refractory periods. So with male sexual medicine, we hear a lot about erectile dysfunction and part of that is coming from the advertisements from Viagra or these um, male enhancing advertisements, but it's not all about erectile dysfunction. We look at premature and delayed ejaculation. Um, we look at penile prosthetic surgery as a means of, of continuing sexuality. Physical abnormalities of the penis, like hypospadias, Peyronie's disease, which is bending of the penis, low libido, low testosterone. And so there are a few studies that say, okay, at, even though with women there's that gradual stop with um, menopause, men over time can get low libido from low testosterone. And then, of course, there's sexual concerns for men after cancer, specifically prostate cancer because a lot of times after prostate cancer, men do have complications with incontinence and um, erectile dysfunction. And then again, STIs. So is this really innate? Like we're talking about kind of the lifespan and sexuality over a lifespan. And so when we look at the sex pleasure cycle, we actually look at desire. So you have desire first, you have that urge to have sex, and then you become aroused. So for women, if they're becoming aroused, they may get lubrication in the vaginal canal start to feel um, aroused in their breasts. For men, they start having erections, they start having a harder a penis, and then this starts to plateau depending on the stimulation, and then orgasm, and then it goes back down to retraction. And so when they actually looked at the sex pleasure cycle and comparing this pleasure to food and um, social events, we looked at puberty, there's a huge peak in all of these hormones for both men and women, but then as we get older, it kind of plateaus a little bit, and then as we reach older age, kind of food, social interactions, and sex does go down a little bit. And so we're talking about pleasure and just the different cycles. And it may be really innate that, you know, these changes in how we view sex um, is something part of our evolution. And especially when we're looking at sexual dysfunction. So this refers to disturbance in the sex response cycle. That, incur that happens in all phases. So imagine if we go back to this, this um, sex pleasure, each component starting either a desire, arousal, plateau, or orgasm, you can have a problem with that um, impacting your sexual dysfunction. So you can say, okay, well, you know, I, um, I had a patient who came in, she's 90 years old and has never had an orgasm. And, you know, I've had patients that come in and they have no sexual desire. So where on that sexual um, cycle are they having a problem with uh, their sexual function? And this basically can um, affect both men and women. So how do we identify these social norms um, and opening discussions with 
uh, regards to sexuality. So get your phones out again. So I want to know from where or from whom did you get your sexual messages? Is it like will, anybody willing to share a story about kind of what you remember very, very uh, distinctly about what you learned? I don't think we have any takers. Okay, so I'll share then. Oh, we have one. Good. <laughs> I'll have that $50 bill for you after, okay? <laughs> I vividly recall at probably about age 12 or 13, my parents handing me a three inch book called The Joys of Sex and said, let us know if you have any questions. <laughs> you know, somebody, I was uh, talking to a class in Missouri yesterday and the woman's like, I don't know if I'm getting older, I just don't remember. And I was like, well, you probably don't remember because it didn't happen. And I remember when I was in fifth grade and we had the sex ed class and they handed you a box with um, a pad in it and this little book. And it said, you know, read the book about to learn about this is your sexual health. But of course, it talked about the changes of puberty, but not what to do with those changes. And so I'm sure anybody else have a story. I was about eight on a road trip with my dad, and we were listening to oldies, and Elvis Presley was one of the songs, artists that we were listening to, and he screwed up not realizing I'm eight years old, and he realized that I didn't understand why you weren't allowed to see Elvis Presley below the waist for TV, <laughs> so then he was in this awkward situation where he had to say, he's like, well, he was moving his hips like you were when you were making a baby, and then he realized eight-year-old me does not know how that works, and on a road trip, had to give me the full discussion. <laughs> So yeah, so it looks like the, the more input that people give here, it looks like friends had a very big influence. If you type up friends and friends and friends, it'll come up. And so friends was a really big component followed by school, parents, and media. And so thank you so much for sharing your stories. I'm gonna, we're gonna watch a short clip here. Oh, <laughs> Ugh. We've already got a line in. Let's switch over to monitor. How are we doing? Doc, he's had 30 minutes of chest pains, nausea, shortness of breath, pulse 104, respirations 18. Let's get the CBC, CMP, cardiac panel at 1280 kg. Yes, Dr. Mr. Sanborn, I'm Dr. Mercer. Are you in any pain right now? I feel some pressure in my chest. It's real tight. Can you show me where the pain is? Right here. Good. What were you doing when the pain started? I was kissing a beautiful woman. Were you having intercourse? Unfortunately, no. Sense of humor intact? <laughs> yeah. Give him an aspirin to top off five milligrams and hang a nitro drip. Mr. Sanborn. Yeah. Your EKG shows you have a blocked artery, which is not allowing enough oxygen to get to the heart muscle. I'm having a heart attack. We're gonna stop it, but I need to know what medications you take. I take Lipitor. To this. Uh, huh? Anything else? Why for blood pressure? What about Viagra? Mr. Sanborn, did you take any Viagra today? Mr. Sanborn? No. No Viagra. Okay, good. Just needed to be sure because I put nitroglycerin into your drip. And if you had taken Viagra, the combination could be fatal. <laughs> So I really like this clip because one, you know, it talks about these mixed messages. One is that, you know, he was the male and he was too macho. He couldn't be taking Viagra, especially when his girlfriend and then future girlfriend that we don't know that early in, but future girlfriend is in standing in the background. So we have all these like mixed messages. We come from, we mentioned friends looking at sex ed at school, talking about our parents or our parents not wanting to talk to us about um, songs 
uh, music, advertising, video games, magazines, and the internet. So lots of confusing messages about how we're getting our sexual education. And so I don't know if any of y'all recognize the Golden Girls. I love the Golden Girls. Um, but it was around 1985 to 1992. And she was a huge sex symbol in this show, but it was very controversial. You know, if you want my, my advice, I think you should sleep with him. And she says, I always take a deep breath before I greet and just thrust my breast forward. I'm the big slut. And so she was trying to, you know, and of course her roommates um, were also these little old ladies and they all just looked at her as like she was a slut, but this was like very risque for the 1980s. And so this is one of the messages that we got on a TV show. And she was saying, oh, I'm a slut. But, you know, if it, the, the roles were reversed and we had a male who was having lots of sex with everybody, it wouldn't have been portrayed the same way. And so this is now social norms from 2004 and 2012. And these were 10 magazines from this, this time frame that they said probably shouldn't have been published. But you see a pretty common theme. And this is what we're, when we're at the grocery stores, even with our kids or with our moms or ourselves, this is what we're seeing about what sex means. We see Jennifer Aniston, we see Eva, um, Eva Mendez and Kim Kardashian, and they have these very youthful bodies that are very sexual. And this is where young girls and even our own selves are getting what sex means and the sexual influence. And I thought this was really interesting. So I looked up the age of Selena Gomez here, and she's 20 years old. But look what's to, the, to her right, which is 50 sex tips. And then under there, how do you flatten your belly? So what messages are we giving about sexuality that you have to flatten your belly to have these 50 really great sex tips and has to be somebody who's young and, and flourishing um, and is not menopausal. And so we have all these mixed messages um, when it comes to sex. And so of course, when we talk about sex in our elderly, no wonder why you know it's such a taboo. So when we talk about those social norms, Again, you're looking at those unmarked bodies that are highly, have high values, looking at signs of age and it being demeaning. Now looking at Botox and lip functions and breast augmentation, pet augmentation and um, booty injections or just anything that's going to keep uh, women and men looking young. And so these cultures um, look at uh, older adults as being devalued because they have wrinkles and they have passed with, you know, having aged bodies. And so looking for males passage of age coming, men tend to have, oh, you know, women have this cutoff and so they're menopausal and now no longer sexy, but men somehow become richer and more powerful. And even the presence of ED can be assaulting to the self-esteem. So Jack Nicholson, who's like, no, 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 I don't take that. Um, and so don't want to face these changes that are quite normal as we get older. And so um, partners may be re reminded or white believe that aging bodies are culprits of slower arousal time, which just also comes with aging. And then there's this huge population that we don't even talk about or that is very um, marginalized, lesbians and gays, as they age and have sexuality problems as well. Um, and so there's little support for this age group. Or this aging population. So how do we change the norms? One is politics. So you know now with the recent um, gay marriages, we have more equality between men and women. So we have women and men now trying to um, have equal rate, uh, equal uh, wage earners, and looking at grandparents coming in and playing a more important role as far as family. Um, but then it also kind of makes it hard. So I know in different cultures, you'll have a grandparents and then you have the parents and then the grandchildren and the great grandchildren. Anybody having sex with lack of privacy um, and people are like, well, if they all live in this house together, they're probably not having sex, but it doesn't change that we don't have that desire or want for sex. And so there's this decreased um, separation or existence of unwanted loneliness. We have values being um, the result of personal values which helps improve this expression, but still this huge gap in this change that's needed so that um, older adults still can be recognized as sexual beings. And so with more people living in, um, living in living situations where they can continue to have sexual partners, and basically what this means is more people in the nursing facilities are having sex, um, which is causing a rise in STIs, and there's education to help 
one, to have preventative sex, a lot of money goes into adolescents looking at um, teenage pregnancy or prevention of STI, HIV in adolescents. But on the opposite side of the spectrum, there's this lack of education. And we're starting to see a rise in HIV and STIs in older adults. So how do we incorporate all of this and use a multidisciplinary approach to improve sexual health for our older adults? So the multidisciplinary team will consist of physicians or clinicians. We look at the psychological aspect, looking at psychiatrists, psychologists, counselors, and sex therapists. Social workers are really big in helping with the multidisciplinary team. Physical therapy, looking at uh, urogenital surgical clinics, pain pelvic clinics, sexual health coordinators that can help bring all of this together. And those of you that are, are um, you know, ger practicing gerontologists or geriatricians know that all of these actually play a really big role in everyday practice of older adults. So when we look at physicians, physicians will play a component where they look at the medical history, uh, they'll look at sexual history, look at the basic um, psychological assessments, physical and gynecologic examinations and laboratory investigations. The problem is, is there's a huge disparity in medical schools that physicians aren't getting this education. So they shy away from wanting to talk about sex. And um, you know, not educated to have that sexual um, component. I went yesterday um, to one of the classes and was learning about um, how to do pelvic exams. And I remember in medical school when I was learning the pelvic exam and learning how to, to check the prostate. And it was very um, um, separated as far as we're looking at this anatomy and we're looking for the STIs and we're looking for any abnormalities. But never was it associated with an actual function. Like what is the pelvis for? What is the vagina for? What is the penis for? What does the prostate do for us? And we have this huge gap in our education as far as, okay, we're going to teach the students that this is what it is, but then we're not going to talk about, well, why do we need it to be healthy? Well, we need it to be healthy so we have really great sex and we have pleasure with sex. And I think somebody mentioned last night that a woman had had sex with her husband for five years and it was painful every single time she had sex and thought that was normal and thought that this was part of sexuality, that sex wasn't about pleasure, it was about reproduction and dealing with the pain. And so if we have better education when it comes to these things, then we know, hey, sex isn't supposed to be painful. We kind of separate um, this anatomical education that we're getting and the education that comes with um, talking about the pleasure component or you know, our families and friends and everybody talks about how this sex is, but nobody talks about the pleasure. So when we talk about medical history, we kind of break this up into age-related metabolic changes, which can, which can be degeneration of the vascular supply. So there's actually studies that look at if somebody, if a young man is starting to have erectile dysfunction, that that is actually a precursor and kind of a red flag for somebody having cardiovascular disease. And this can appear actually three, um, three years before actually having a heart attack or being diagnosed with high blood pressure. So imagine the vessels around the penis are very small, but same vasculature that goes around the heart. So, uh, you know, I was telling somebody, I gave grand rounds on sexual health and my um, division head, um, who's in charge of the entire internal medicine department is cardiology. He said, oh, I'm sorry, I missed your grand rounds. What was it on? And I said, sexual health. And he turned like beat red. He's like, oh, okay. And he was ready to change the subject and run out of the room. And I'm like, do you understand how big a deal that how um, your, heart, your heart and your penis are linked together and you can prevent heart disease if you recon recognize erectile dysfunction three years earlier? So uh, degeneration of vascular supply is very important. Looking at neuron neuronal function, looking at uh, neuropathy, looking at uh, diabetes, as a, a looking at nerves that go to this area. Um, decline in sexual hormones, as we talked about, and then overall general morbidity. So we look at age-related effect, and we look at how mood can affect um, sexuality. So we say, you know, if you're, it's kind of almost like a catch-22, you're depressed, and so you don't want to have sex. And then if you're, you're having um, sexual problems, like erectile dysfunctional function or no de uh, decreased desire or arousal, then you don't really want to have sex. So it's this kind of catch-22 where you don't want to 
um, how it's impacting um, your desire or your drive to have sex um, in conjunction with the actual function of your sexual organs. And then deterioration in cognitive function. So if somebody's having dementia or cognitive decline, or on the opposite side, there are some dementias that make dementias that make patients hypersexual. So how is this impacting um, sexuality? And then looking at age-related changes as far as loss of independence. So as patients get older, if they're becoming more independent, imagine I do have a couple that comes in and this is their maybe second or third marriage and both of them are in the late 80s. And the man's had um, erectile dysfunction for 10 years but enjoys giving oral sex to his wife. And the wife had enjoyed it at first, but then really wasn't interested in having sex any longer. And so one of the components was that he was starting to have uh, lower extremity edema, which was limiting his mobility. He was now, he initially was walking with a cane when they first got married, and now walking with a, a rollator walker with the four wheels and a little chair so he can sit and rest. And so he's physically declined, and now they don't do as much together. They don't have that open communication and the communica communication intimacy that they had before. So now she's almost in a more caregiver role, and that loss of independence has really impacted their sexual life. So when we talk about sexual history, how do we start and open this conversation and open communication for um, getting... Um, this sexual history. So there's a mnemonic called sex pass. And sex past actually improves communication between providers and patients. So one of the things is to be really straightforward. Um, and so a lot of times if you're kind of skirting around the issue and be like, oh, so how is your sex going? Or are you having any problems down there? You know, so patients sense when you're scared and they they know when you're uncomfortable. And so part of it is becoming comfortable with saying masturbation and penis and erections and orgasms and ejaculation and being very comfortable. You know, I think probably when I first started, I felt kind of relieved to say these words out loud, but I didn't get there overnight. It's not something that we're socially taught to be comfortable with, but over time you will become comfortable if you practice. And so one of the things is about being straightforward and if, say, for instance, I had a patient, his hemoglobin A1C, I think was 18, probably one of the higher ones I'd seen, and he's like, Doc, I'm having trouble with my mojo. And I'm like, okay. And so you can use some of the words that they're more comfortable with. And I'd be like, okay, well, tell me about what this mojo is. And he's like, you know, it's not working. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And so trying to get more history and get on to the level where you're having this open conversation. But if your doctor says, oh, you know, um, Doc, I'm having trouble with my mojo, and you're like, hmm, well, let's, let's see what your blood pressure is doing today, and how is, how is the family, you know, kind of totally go smoothing over it, you know, this is kind of what doctors do. I've heard lots of stories of doctors kind of just floating over the area, and these areas are not um, being addressed. One of the things is to be empathetic. Um, so I'm sure you guys have a lot of... Um, training on delivery of bad news or communication or how to talk to patients. This is the same way, but it's related to sex and something very personal. We look at examination and expectations. So looking at, uh, for hypogonadism, looking for enlarged breasts in men, looking at vaginal atrophy, looking at physical signs that let us know um, how to better help the patient as far as our sexual history. Expectations I learned kind of late on. So I had this patient, he was like 82, and he came in and he masturbated every day. And I was like, every day? He says, every day. I'm like, do you skip some days? He's like, no, every day. And so I'm like, okay. He's like, I have this big problem. I'm like, okay, what's, well, what's the problem? He's like, well, you know, some days I have a little bit of ejaculate and sometimes I only have a little bit, and sometimes it's only like a drop. And I said, well, when is it a drop? I was like, how many days into your masturbation does it, you know, become so little? And he thought it was completely abnormal that he didn't have the same amount of ejaculate every day. And so when he actually came to see me, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, he's like, can you help me? I had actually given a talk at a sexual health center, 
And I said, sure, come in, tell me about your problem, I'll see what I can do. When he came in to see me, I was like, I didn't set the line, like, hey, this is normal. And he, so he was expecting that I was gonna come in and be like, here's this, and it's gonna improve your ejaculation, and you're gonna have the same amount of ejaculation every day. And so he was quite disappointed by our visit and was upset that he drove across town in Houston traffic to come see me when I couldn't help him. And so setting those expectations and being like, okay, well, you know what? I'll try to help you the best way I can. You know, there may be limitations to what we can do. And then seeing a patient a couple of um, couple months later, this man who was 92 had, ne had not had an erection in over 20 years, had tried um, penile injections, had tried Viagra, tried all the oral supplements over the counter, and I kept saying, okay, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this, and finally realizing, you know what, I need to refer him to urology because he probably needs a penile pump, but he was also quite disappointed because I didn't set those expectations of, well, you've had erectile dysfunction for 20 years, I may not be able to help you and help them get to the point where they're maybe more accepting of their new diagnosis of erectile dysfunction. And so setting those expectations are really important. And now I'm saying, okay, well, let's see what we can do and not say right away, I'd like to help you. But as a physician, I wanted to be like, oh, sure, I can help you. We can figure this out. But really figuring it out may be getting to that acceptance where they have to find different means of having sex where it's not penetrative. Like my other gentleman that I mentioned, and it's his sex is about oral sex. Um, asking about partners, so looking at male or female or both, or even multiple partners, I mentioned I have a patient who's polyamorous. Um, avoiding being judgmental, so when I met the polyamorous patient, I'd never heard of polyamory, um, and this was a few years ago, and trying to like say, well, you know, it's hard enough for me to keep up with my husband, more or less have three or four husbands, but he really enjoyed having multiple partners and being open to hear about these different um, situations because everyone is different and how they view and express sexuality is different. And then looking at the satisfaction with sexual function and looking at, well, you know, this woman who never had an orgasm and she's 90 years old, she's enjoyed having sex even though she hasn't had an orgasm. So it has been satisfying to her. Whereas somebody else who's never, who's never had an orgasm, their goal may be to come in to see you and they want to have orgasms, and how are you gonna help them improve their sexual function? And then of course, looking at treatments. So how do we open this discussion? So one of the things you can say is, can you tell me, have you noticed any changes in your sexual desire since we started X medication? So medications are the biggest culprit for having a change in sexual desire. There's probably, 10 classes of medications that cause erectile dysfunction. So if you start a patient on a medication, is it possible that that medication causes, and I've had patients come in and their blood pressure's through the roof and their risk for stroke, and I'm like, are you taking that anti-hypertensive um, anti medication that I started? And they're like, no, because um, I started noticing that, you know, I started having erectile dysfunction. And so you have to, you know, try different, uh, different medications of different classes, one, to prevent the patient from having a stroke, but if sex is that important to them and they'd rather have a stroke than not have sex, then, you know, that's something that you probably need to address. Um, what about what concerns do you have about fulfilling your sexual needs? For some people, maybe fulfilling their sexual needs um, is not as important, but if we're not asking these questions, then we're not going to know. In what ways has your section, uh, sexual relationship with your partner changed since dot, dot, dot? So I mentioned the male and the male and the female that got married. They've been married for three years. They're, they're not close to their 90s. You know, she didn't realize that she was going to have changes in how she felt about him and how she viewed sexuality. But when he started having more medical problems and now requiring um, a walker for being more dependent, this to her was very um, like a turnoff to her. And so trying to find that out and trying to see, well, what changed in the relationship and what can we do to try to make that better? So what interventions or information can I provide to help you fulfill your sexuality? So asking about what can you do? And again, this may be a little bit along with the expectations because you may not be able to provide 
everything, but asking those questions because it's such an important quality of life um, measure, then it's important to at least address it. So normalizing it is very, very important. So often um, things change when you get cancer. Have you noticed any changes in your sexual enjoyment? Does this change concern you? So for this woman, she came in and she said, you know what? I was really not that interested in sex to begin with, but I know my partner, like on a scale of zero to 10, 10 being the most important, it was a 10 for him and say like a two for her. And so for her, she came in and she was not distressed about it at all. She's like, I have lots of things that I like to do. I like to go bird watching and I enjoy friend, you know, and time with my friends and going to the theater. But for him, this was very distressing. So when I was seeing her individually, um, the concern was really it's not a problem unless it's distressing. So for him, it was distressing and how we were gonna do couples counseling to try to figure out how do they meet in the middle. And so do you want to do anything about this? So for the female, when I saw her first, I'm like, well, why are you here? And she said, because my husband says that I need to get my libido back. I'm like, well, what do you think about that? She's like, I'm fine. It doesn't bother me at all. But my husband wants you to give me something. And I was like, okay, but do you want me to give you something? She's like, no. I'm like, okay, problem solved. But the, the real challenge came when he came in and I said, when I saw him on my schedule, I'm like, uh-oh. I'm like, what did I do? I'm like, is he going to come in and yell at me because I told her, him that, her that it was okay for, him, for her not to have sex with him? And it was just him getting, getting to a new level and just opening up that communication. So what difference has this change made on how you feel about yourself? So again, I mentioned some women, uh, uh, breasts are very um, part, much part of their sexuality, getting their breasts touched and caressed. And somebody who has a mastectomy that doesn't have those breasts any longer, how does this, make, how does this change impact your sexuality? What about your body? What about your sexuality? So looking at different components and different stages as the body changes. So has, have these changes made a difference to your relationship? How has your partner reacted? Uh, many people explore intimacy in the relationship in other ways. If they experience these changes, this is something that you've considered. So imagine this man who comes in, he hasn't had an erection for 10 years, and has always had, you know, he, he was recently a widow, I want to say for like a year or two years before he started dating his, his new wife. Um, but even in that relationship, he had already accepted that he didn't, um, couldn't get erections, but found other ways to be intimate. And it doesn't even have to be through oral sex. It can be through massaging. It can be through caressing. It could be through handholding. And for this woman, um, you know, she, what was really important to her is the intellectual thing. And because they stopped doing things together, that was a huge turnoff for her. So each person in exploring how these um, relationships click together and trying to explore different ways to keep that intimacy. And it doesn't have to necessarily be um, penetrative sex. Are you satisfied with your sex response cycle or your sex re sexual response? So again, we talked about the sex response cycle and how many different ways your sexuality can be impacted. So is it erection, is it fir firmness, is it orgasm, is it about lubrication, and trying to find where that source came from. So for instance, for a woman, we talked about how with the change of menopause, that lubrication takes a little bit longer. Are there lubrications that we can give to the woman to kind of help with this stimulation? How often are you engaging in sexual activities? Is this normal for you? Are you satisfied with this? Has your cancer diagnosis or treatment affected the way you see yourself as a husband, a wife, a partner, a man, a woman, a sexual being? This man that came in and was now reliant on um, a walker and couldn't go to the theater anymore, this was huge on his self-esteem. He's like, it's not that I don't wanna do these things. If I physically could, I would wanna do these things with my wife. I didn't expect that I, in the three years that we were going to be married, that my, um, that my health condition would change so much. And so that's really that self-esteem component that comes in with the aging body 
and how is that affecting his sexuality? He felt like he was a man because he was able to take his wife to the theater and now he can't. And the only thing he can do is sit in a book, you know, sit in his room and read a book. That's really limiting how he views himself and really impacts um, his sexual desires as well. What aspects of your sexuality do you believe have been affected by your cancer diagnosis? How important is sexual intimacy to you? So not for everybody, but again, it's really important that you ask because it's a huge quality of life. You wanna ask the patients if intimacy is important to them. And have you talked to your partner about your feelings? So this was the one thing about this couple that I keep mentioning is the wife comes in individually and then a month, and I, so I have my clinic once a month and then the man came in and then they came in together. And so I actually saw them together in, in March and opened up communication. And he was not, when he left my office, he was like, you know, I, I, I think I'm okay with not having sex. If she doesn't want to have it, I love her. I want to be with her and I'm okay with not having sex. Well, when he came back the next month, he's like, she decided this one-sided. I feel very betrayed. Um, she didn't even open communication with me to talk about it. And so that's what I really helped with that counseling component. So tell me, and they had never discussed, so what she told me and what he told me together, they had never told each other. And so one of my recommendations was to tell them, hey, you know, can you start doing things together again? Maybe they had stopped having coffee in the morning. They stopped watching TV together. Um, of course, the theater, going to the theater was a little more difficult, so they weren't doing that, but they also had cut out so many other activities that I didn't know about that actually impacted their level of intimacy that, you know, she wanted more of the intellectual things like I mentioned, but they never talked about these things together. So my recommendation, do more activities together, and they're supposed to come back to see me this month, but that's part of them coming to see me and asking these questions so that way I can improve their life or their sexuality and intimacy. So moving on to the assessment, we talked about how we open up questions, how we ask about sex, sex history using our sex past mnemonic. Um, so that is a very critical uh, component is eliciting that sexual history. But it's also looking at um, their height, their weight, their blood pressure, their pulses, patients that are morbidly obese, um, have more problems with um, sexual dysfunction, looking at our thyroid, lungs, breast, heart, abdomen, genitalia, looking for something on physical exam to find what could be impacting their sexuality. And I think I mentioned hypogonadism, gynecomastia, um, or just looking at physical changes with um, deterioration of the vascular supply. Medication review is huge. Looking at the medications, I mentioned, like I said, 10 classes, that I can think of that impact sexuality or the medications that we can change or try that may not impact their sexuality as much. Looking at lipids, glucose, thyroid, FSH, LH, DHEA, prolactin, estradiol, looking at um, free and total testosterone as well as PSA. And the reason the PSA is so important is because once you start a man on um, testosterone, you have to monitor the PSA because it is a hormone and can impact the prostate. Of course, you, I mentioned the CATCH-22, so you want to do depression screening and then CAGE. Anybody familiar with CAGE? What is CAGE for? Thank you, alcoholism. Another $50 to the guy in the back. <laughs> All right. So looking at the psychiatry, psychologic counseling, and, and uh, sex therapy component. So of course we've talked about kind of the medical things, how do we bring it up, but a huge component also is looking at um, how we're feeling, how are we dealing with stressors, how we're dealing with coping styles. Um, I, I know when I'm really stressed out, the last thing that I'm thinking about is sex and how am I dealing with stress and how is that impacting sex. I'm sure if you're studying for finals and doing your boards and are really busy, the higher stress that you have, sex kind of falls down by the wayside. But how is this impacting you psychologically? Um, are you sexually compulsive? Do you have a sex addiction? Um, low, or sexual, low sexual desire or interest? Is this new or old? Looking at gender dysphoria and patterns of communication. So when we're talking about all of these things, we actually, there's a, something called a plicit model. 
And the implicit model is how we kind of draw out um, these sexual um, problems as far as a psychological component or counseling com component. So step one is permission. So we wanna give clarification, and this is kind of the round table discussion, which I'm gonna go into a little bit um, in a little bit. We give limited information, basic counseling and information. We do specific suggestions, biomedical and, and behavioral, and then give intense couple therapy and sex therapy. And a lot of times with this intense couple and sex therapy, by that time you probably need to refer them to a therapist and somebody with more experience. So like right now with my patients, they came in, we talked about, you know, we normalized the, the components of aging. I did some basic counseling. I gave specific um, suggestions on how to do some behavioral things to help with their sexuality. And so this is probably the second time I'm gonna see them together. And usually I'll probably see them like four to five times. And if they still have a lot of issues, that's when I need to refer them to somebody with more um, therapy training. So one of the things about the round table discussion is looking at destructive myths about sexuality. So we talked earlier about what these influences are. We got TV, media, songs, music, parents, friends. And so these are some myths that make sexuality very destructive. Uh, looking at no, no love without sex. So looking at them as, as something done together. A healthy woman always has an orgasm. So are we saying my 90-year-old patient that's never had an orgasm isn't healthy? Uh, no sex without love. Sex must lead to an orgasm, which isn't true. My gentleman that only gives oral sex to his partner, he's perfectly fine expressing his sexuality just through oral sex, and he doesn't need that orgasm to feel close to his partner. Uh, masturb masturbation is only for single people. To help, oh, to have no sex leads to health problems, maybe. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, a man wants sex always and can have sex always. So a myth. Um, passion equals love. Sex must be spontaneous. So sex, sex in the older population doesn't have to be spontaneous. So I had a patient who um, the woman had, I think she had cancer and always had a lot of energy in the morning. And so planning sex saying, okay, well, if you have the most energy in the morning, then you probably should have sex in the morning instead of waiting to the night. So sex doesn't have to be spontaneous. Uh, menopausal women lose interest in sex, definitely not true. Women want less sex than men, not true. Although, you know, society has led us to believe that it, sex is more important to men, but there's just as many women that want to continue a healthy sex life. Uh, women always need longer foreplay. Also not true, you know, women and men, both as they age, need longer foreplay. Women to have more lubrication and men to reach harder um, erections. Uh, pornographic or por pornography is only for men. Uh, sex always includes intercourse, which is not true. And so talking to families or talking to patients about this and normalizing what's true and false, and it's important also for our own education to know that all of these things are something that maybe we have heard in the past, and these are all myths. So these aren't true. And then normalizing them for our patients so that they know what's true and false. Um, looking at limited information and basic counseling, so explaining the physiology and psychology of sexual function. So again, that guy who came in and his ejaculate was getting a little bit less every day. My suggestion was like, if you wanna have more ejaculate, don't masturbate every day you know, letting him know that that was normal. It's normal that you kind of run out of ejaculate if you're gonna masturbate every day. How does aging impact this? Um, he said, well, I, when I was in my 20s, I had the same amount of ejaculation. I always had lots of ejaculation. Okay, but that was when you were in your 20s. And again, um, normalizing what normal physiology is for older men. How older, oh, so how other individuals and couples experience change is also an important step to helping the couple better understand what's happening. Um, clinicians diminish, um, clinician diminishes shame and difficulties associated with talking about sexuality. So again, if your um, doctor, you could bring it up to your doctor and your doctor's not comfortable with it or blows it off, of course the patient's not gonna get the help they need. Um, so of course, re-emphasizing correction of the social cultural myths is very important helping couples become more aware of their sexual ideas, and helping couples write their own scripts. 
So, you know, for this couple, trying to find other ways to be intimate is really important and, and kind of drawing out that information. So I kind of kind of cut it short and said, okay, this is what I recommended. But I said, you know what? What I'm hearing is that you used to watch TV together. And this was really important connection and spending that time together. Have you thought about doing that again? And so trying to get them to find their own script for what, how are they going to connect? And giving patients that autonomy is really important. So when they actually looked at these recommendations and what it did for patients, patients were like, nobody talks about it. It feels so good to be understood and taken seriously. The main thing for us was that we learned about ourselves and that we can better understand what happens to our sexual life. So imagine when we're younger and we're handed this box with a little pad in it and it has nothing to do with sexuality, you know, it's, it's something that's continuing um, throughout the lifespan and not understanding what our bodies are doing, whether we go through puberty or that we're going through menopause or later on. And so what's normal? Um, we've never been able to really talk about our feelings. That sex and love may mean so different things to each other, to each of us. And so again, what's important to one may not be important to the other in helping with that communication. So once you get all of this out and you give them, um, straighten out the myths and we talk about um, what the, the problems are, we wanna try to give specific suggestions. So we look at the biomedical and um, behavioral component of it. And one is to streamline the medications. For women, we look at vaginal dryness. Um, moisturizers and vaginal dilators. Uh, for men, we look at the PDE5 inhibitors, vacuum pumps, um, penile injections, urethral suppositories, and penile implants. And so these are all um, modes to try to help men with their erectile dysfunction. When we talk about behavioral interventions, I, meant, I mentioned uh, planning sex. So one of the big myths about sex is that it has to be spontaneous. And what it, media tells us, that, right? Like on all the TV shows, they don't talk about the Viagra that's needed an hour beforehand or maybe on a daily, a daily, um, daily regimen. They think that, okay, you know, they, they meet two people at a bar and they're highly sexually attracted to each other and all of a sudden they're having sex, but we never saw the condom, we never saw preventative things. And we think that it always has to be desire or it has to always be spontaneous, but that's not true. And so couples should be aware that they have this, um, this decision to have sex. And so this part of this may be watching erotic videos or reading literature together or looking at porn or looking at magazines, talking about their fantasies. So what you may have really liked in your early 30s and 40s may not be how you don't necessarily look at sex when you're in your 50s, 60s, or 70s. And talking about exploration and then integrating masturbation into it. So you know, one of the things we were talking about yesterday is that a lot of women don't know, or a lot of women don't know that they have three exits down there. So we have the urethra, we have the vaginal canal, and then we have the anus. You'd be surprised how many women in my clinic don't know that there's three holes down there, and I have to draw a picture. Women aren't as comfortable, especially older women, about what is going on down there. And I still have women that wipe from to front, and so I'm like, there's this education that's lacking. And so if we're not able to even know what our anatomy looks like down there, how are we going to integrate masturbation? So also becoming um, very comfortable with masturbation. I know I grew up Catholic and masturbation was a no-no. You don't do that, you're gonna go to hell if you have masturbation. And so incorporating that and trying again to, to debunk those myths so that patients are becoming more comfortable with their own bodies. Um, I have a gentleman, I have all these stories, 55 year old man with um, 55 multiple myeloma um, came in, he was diagnosed with multiple myeloma four years ago and has not had an erection since. And I said, well, have you tried masturbation to see if you could get an erection? He said, you know what, I'm Muslim, I'm not allowed to do that. And so looking at masturbation and trying to figure out different means to help patients um, with their sexual function, of course, massage. So when we look at a tense couple and sex therapy, this can be related to fantasy and looking at body approaches, in addition to the other approaches that we talked about, looking at body awareness. So again, be, being very comfortable with um, what your anatomy is, it seems to be more 
um, impactful for women because we you have to actually bend and look down, whereas men, their sex component is on the outside. And, um, you know, so becoming very aware of your body, teaching patients about masturbation exercises. I gave the res sexualityresources.com has a huge resource for all of you guys to print and give to patients about masturbation. So if they're not comfortable about with masturbation, giving them kind of resources so they, they can do that in privacy. And then becoming more familiar with um, sex toys and bringing in sex toys for um, improving sexuality. Um, again, erotic videos, looking at couple-oriented interventions with sensate focus, which is taught by Masters and Johnson or Masters and Johnson um, component, and then looking at psychotherapeutic approaches, looking at psychodynamic, cognitive, behavioral, and systematic. And so again, this is all intense therapy for you guys to know, but again, this is left up to the sexual therapist, and they usually have more training. But you're kind of getting them ready with the, the medical history and the sexual history and referring them out to sex rehab, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes. So one thing is to help the couple to become aware of the blockages and destructive interventions, which can lead to self-fulfilling prophecies regarding the, the partner's behavior and reactions and thus hindering change. So they said, oh, you know what? It's normal for my penis not to work. It's part of getting old and that's the way it's gonna be and not trying to figure out why it's happening and accepting it as part of normalcy um, can hinder any change. Replacing these patterns with either uh, more effective repair mechanisms or uh, new patterns of communication and then activate the responses and experiences. I think I may be out of time, so I'm gonna skip down. We talked about the sex rehab. Um, and sex rehab can include the, method, the medical methods, physical methods. We talked a lot with physical therapists yesterday and helping with pelvic floors. And pelvic floor is not only for just uh, fem or only for females and incontinence, but also for males. Looking at surgical methods such as prenile prosthesis to help with that, and then the counseling with the placet. So. Health promotion is really important when you're talking about sexuality, developing a trusting relationship, advocating for the patients and showing empathy. We look at preventative strategies. Again, preventative strategies kind of just go throughout what we're teaching our patients. Looking at exercise. Exercise is so important for circulation and you know, looking at posture, nutrition, having a healthy lifestyle and, and rest. Um, and how does this impact our quality of life? So, Impacting for quality of life helps with self-identity, general well-being. It satisfied physical needs. It, promote, it fulfills so many things on a social, emotional, and psychological level. It evokes sentiments of romance, affection, passion, and intimacy. So my pearls today really are, we really need to emphasize in wellness and looking at sexual health as an activity of daily living. Y'all said it perfect just from the beginning. You need to focus on positive and respectful relationships, address sexual health regularly with the context of ongoing medical care and normalize it as part of asking, are you taking your medications? Are you having sex? And kind of making it part of your normal everyday uh, conversations with your patients. Acknowledge sexual expression over a, life, a lifespan. Um, looking at holistic care as part of this patient-centered care to address sexual medicine. And of course, acknowledgement of this sexual health as an element of overall health. Any questions? This is my last, it's just my poem. I love the notebook. I just watched it like, I hadn't watched it in a while and there was so much I didn't remember, but this was the Walt Whitman um, poem that they talk about in the, um, the movie, The Notebook. Thank you very much. So I want to turn to the folks in Kirksville first. Can we see them? Is that possible? and ask if they have any questions, and then we'll take questions here. Okay, okay. I don't, I don't think we have any questions so on our end. Any questions on you guys' uh, No questions Janet? from Kirksville. Any questions in the room? No. Okay. Nice to see some familiar faces from yesterday. <laughs> Any questions in the room here? One in the back. One in the back? Where at? Where is it? Okay.
I, I just was gonna ask, so you mentioned a person that had like the A1C at 18. Um, you, you don't wanna gloss over their concern right away about sexuality, but you, I, I'm sure you have to say, well, we need to get you a little bit healthy. We need to worry sure. about this problem that could cause you to you know, have serious health consequences. But I don't want, I'm not, I, I don't want to say this isn't important, but it's probably something we can better work on if we can get, am I correct, get your medical situation a little bit more under control? Or how do you approach that? Well, you know, I told him, I said, you know, that's a really good question. I said, you know, what if I told you that if we got your hemoglobin A1C within normal limits, that your mojo would come back? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And he's like, well, what do you mean? And I was like, and I kind of went through the pathophysiology of why diabetes affects um, erectile dysfunction. And he came to see me and we started moving it down. Unfortunately, it was when I was a resident. And so I never got to see him come back and it actually back be into the normal range. But he actually did made a, make a lot of lifestyle changes because that sex component was so important to him. It just says a lot why it has to be addressed in all levels of the care so that people can... Yeah take over their health management. No, of course, and that was really important to him. He really wanted to have sex, and so I said, okay, I can do that for you, but this is what <laughs> you're gonna have to do to get there. Any other questions on either end? Oh, would you mind? Uh, last night, you spoke a little bit about um, issues in um, both positive and negative in long-term care facilities and helping staff be more understanding and patients freedom um, match and mismatch on um, sexuality uh, preferences uh, if you could say a little more about that that would be really helpful I think thank so, you so sure so the question is how does how is sexuality impacted in assisted living facilities so I think it depends. A lot of it comes from education. I know the social workers are, um, is the, the approach that we use as a team base to kind of get the education out there. Part of it is educating staff that this is a part of normal um, life. And I think education is so important. I know in, in Texas, one of the social workers I met with, she gives an annual um, workshop every year to the staff to say, okay, if we walk in on somebody who's having sex, what are we going to do about it? But globally, there's such a scarcity of having this education that, you know, I think each individual nursing home would have to be um, educated individually because right now there's no nat nationwide policy for sexual, um, for, for continuing sexuality and sexual experiences in the nursing home. So it's a huge gap. Um, I just had a question regarding uh, spiritual beliefs and uh, things like pornography, masturbation, things of that matter. So what's kind of the workaround or work through uh, with that kind of stuff? Because for some people, their sexual health maybe isn't worth their eternal soul. Sure. So with the, the man that I mentioned with the multiple myeloma, I said, okay, well, we can't do masturbation. One of the things that I want you to start looking at, well, I did the workup, so he ended up having low testosterone, so I started him on. Um, testosterone. I started him on Cialis um, and um, actually asked him to kind of look to see whether or not he started having morning erections. So one of the things is, okay, I'm not able to see what he can do with masturbation because masturbation is a really good um, cue for physicians and clinicians. So if they masturbate and they're able to do it on their own, but say they're not able to do it with a partner, that's kind of probably saying there may be a relationship problem and kind of guiding us through this algorithm. But because I couldn't get that from him, I said, okay, let's check these things. I started him on the testosterone and the Cialis, and he started having more interactions. And so now, well, he had a really great month of sex um, until he relapsed into his multiple myeloma. So now the more of the concentration is now um, about him getting the chemotherapy for his multiple myeloma. But even though he hadn't had erection for four years, I knew that he was capable with just these little adjustments in addressing the low testosterone and the Cialis. Is there another question on the other end? Yeah, we have a question in Kirksville. So uh, in the, the terms of uh, RF and 
vaginal uh, and laser rege rejuvenation. Have you seen that to be a, a positive factor in, in women that have significant sexual dysfunction? So you're talking about like the, the laser treatment such as Mona Lisa, is that what you're referring right. to? Okay. Um, so a lot of OBGYNs and, uh, that I have that are my colleagues do have really great um, improvement with it. So basically what they do is they put these small little um, kind of laser to rejuvenate the vagina and it helps with moisture, it helps with vaginal pain, helps with vaginismus. Um, and so I have had colleagues say they had really great improvement with it. Um, it's not something that I specifically do in my clinic, but I do definitely refer out to urogynecologists for this procedure and at least evaluation. Any other questions on this end or that end? So I have two questions and I wrote them down. Um, going back to what you talked about and how like nursing homes now are having a higher prevalence of STIs. If, I guess I don't know like when the sex ed started, but if they were able to like go their whole life and then now that they're in a nursing home, they're starting to have STIs, do you know what the correlation, I guess is my first question. So I t talked a little bit yesterday about the, con I, they call them condo cowboys. So men are living less, or women are living longer than men. And so for men, they may have a selection of five or six, maybe seven women um, in the nursing facilities and men, um, there's, you know, the correlation between reproduction and sex and pregnancy. And they're like, okay, well, this older woman can't get pregnant, so I don't need a condom. And so there's that correlation behind, oh, it's safer now to have sex because I can't get her pregnant. And then forgetting about the STIs as a component. The problem is, is that um, these men are also paying for sex um, outside of the nursing facility commonly and they're bringing the STIs into the nursing facility by sex workers. And so they're kind of transmitting it to these multiple women within the nursing facility, um, but not worrying about the kind of pregnancy part of it. So it's something that um, isn't necessarily being, is not on the radar as something that can be transmitted. Uh, one of the things I was talking about yesterday is that I'm, I'm diagnosing a lot of patients in my clinic with syphilis, um, and syphilis is now on the rise um, in the United States. Okay. And then my second one was when you were talking about um, like how cardiovascular could be associated with like you could detect it like three years earlier with erectile dysfunction. Is there like an equivalent to females for doing that? No, unfortunately not. Um, with one of the things I was thinking about with that question is that there is a compromise of the vascular supply. Um, so we see erectile dysfunction for women. They may not necessarily have that. There are um, devices. One is the penile pump for men. So it basically has a ring at the bottom that has a pump. And you basically, it um, improves blood flow by doing this pumping mechanism. To, and the ring holds the pressure in so that the, rec, the erection stays firm. There is a similar device for women that basically looks like a little cup and it cups the clitoris and the vagina, and it kind of does suction as well to help with vascular supply. So vascular um, supply to either the vagina or the um, penis has shown to help improve with arousal and um, orgasms in both men and women. But there's nothing like specific to, is there a sign for women like the erectile dysfunction now? Any other questions? It's good for me. The first is more a comment that there's a common theme that runs through the majority of your presentation, which is in communication and the difficulty in communicating openly about sexual health. Uh, there's probably some generational aspects to that in which those who were teens and, and emerging in their sexuality in the 40s and 50s uh, have a very different perspective to the social acceptability of having those discussions freely. Um, and in a rapid paced primary care setting, taking the opportunity to establish a relationship and communicate these concerns and, and appreciating it as an activity of daily living uh, is essential, but it is one of multiple priorities, unfortunately. 
Uh, my question is regarding this emergence of CBD products uh, and some of them specifically targeting sexual wellness and um, uh, libido. Uh, and if you're, I, I realize you practice out of Texas and the laws there are different, you know, across the patchwork of states. Uh, have you heard or seen any uh, effective utilization of CBD products for helping people who have dyspareunia of any variety? To be honest with you, no, I haven't actually. Um, because my sexual practice is fairly new, it may be something that may be coming on the horizon, but I haven't up until this point. Uh, part of the problem with um, you know, the sexual therapist and having access to other care is that our patients that are in this age group only have Medicare, they're on limited incomes. And, you know, most sexual therapists um, for sex therapy is all out of pocket. So it's about 120 to $160, at least in Texas, to be seen for one session. And so, you know, there's limitations to um, what I see in, the, in my population, but also if they were to go outside to have more intense therapy or intense, you know, consults, it may not be paid for with this limited income. Um, the elderly or the older population are definitely at a disadvantage. Anyone else? Going once? Twice? So do you think fundamentally at the root of all of the issues that you talked about today is it is the educational component? I know in places like Sweden and Denmark, they have sexual education in Germany as well in kindergarten and their teen pregnancy rate is almost not, nothing. It's almost non-existent. Um, and then the same thing goes for kind of aging adults continuing this education process um, and, and thus through that normalizing sex and all the facets of it you know, through that course and kind of changing the culture around it, basically with education. Do you think that's a good place to start? With no, that? for sure. And actually there's studies, I was thinking of saying 8% of schools in the United States actually teach accurate sexual health to um, adolescents. So imagine 8%. If they're, and then they're still practice, or they're still teaching a lot of abstinence. And so abstinence is not really teaching us about sexuality. It's saying just don't do it. And so there's a huge gap that starts from a very young age. I know when I, I did a, um, my sexual uh, training at the University of Michigan, and there were people in the class that said, you know, you know, one of the, I always remember this one uh, woman, she said, oh, my sister liked to masturbate, and she would go around rubbing on the poles in the house and stuff. And the dad said, you know what, it's okay that you do that, but you need to do it in privacy. And so I felt like that was really something encouraging, not saying, oh, that's dirty, you can't do that. Um, you can do it, just do it behind closed doors. And so that's not a message that's commonly given to us from our parents. It's like, or from the church or religion or friends, it's like, okay, if you're going to be rubbing and doing those kind of things, you're not supposed to do it. It's not, yes, you can just do it in privacy. And then I guess just a little caveat. So is, I went to a private school and actually did not see, receive a single bit of sexual education at all. Uh, is that mandated by any sort of federal law or anything like that? Is regardless of public or private, just mm -hmm. basically up to the institution? Yeah, usually it is. Okay. Which is why only like 8%. Right. I mean, because there's, mm -hmm. if imagine 8% throughout the entire United States say that they're giving accurate information. So the 90, other 92% can do what they want with the education and they do. Anything else? Yeah. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you all for coming.